Welcome back to the Policy Viz podcast. I'm your host, John Schwabish. Spring is here, blue skies, cut grass, warm weather. My allergies are out of control, but I hope you are well and safe and healthy. I am very excited for this week's episode of the podcast. I have my good friend Francis Gagnon here. Francis founded the information design company Voila back in 2013 in Montreal. Francis and I go way back to when I was first getting started in teaching data visualization and presentation skills, and we've worked together for a number of years. And it's really been uh, an omission on my part not to have Francis on the podcast uh, prior uh, to this week. So I'm very excited he was able to take time out and talk to me about his company and his work. As you're going to hear, it's a really interesting conversation that we have uh, because we're not gonna focus so much on the actual process uh, that Francis and his team go through in creating visualizations, in creating both the print and online products that they make. We're actually gonna talk about this concept of building an information design company. I think as we all know, there are lots of freelancers around in the data visualization space, but there are not as many uh, companies in the data visualization uh, space. And so Francis talks about his evolution going from working at the World Bank to starting his own firm, freelancing, and then building up a team behind him. So I hope you really enjoyed this week's episode of the show. So uh, Francis worked for a long time at the World Bank, as you're going to hear. His work has been cited by The Economist, by cited by uh, Fast Company, and he's appeared several times in the best of the visualization web at visualizingdata.com, run by Andy Kirk. He's also one of the founders of Visualization Montreal, which is a meetup group that has almost 2,000 members uh, now. And as you'll hear, he really reached out to people in the Montreal community to sort of build out that data visualization group. So it's a really interesting conversation. I think something that we haven't really discussed so much on uh, this show about building out these firms and these teams. And I think you're really going to enjoy this week's episode of the show. So here is my interview with Francis, and I hope you will enjoy it. Hey, Francis, good to see you. Welcome to the show. Looking dapper as always. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Schwabish. <laughs> nice to be here. <laughs> um, you really uh, you really do class up the joint, I got to tell you. I should... <laughs> We should be doing this as like a video podcast. Like I get that a lot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are things in Montreal? How is business? How How is everything? Oh, my God. Well, first, it's spring in Montreal, and you really have to go through a Canadian winter to appreciate spring as much as we do. So, yep. of course, it's probably like what... 10 Celsius here, so everybody's wearing shorts and t-shirts you know, because we're <laughs> celebrating. This is, right. this is the joke of the Northern people. But yeah, things, I mean, I would say with confinement uh, and third waves and all, I think it's very much on our mind and, and we've been reopening maybe too much, maybe not enough, or like the, this is this is really what's going on. It's, it's a universal, it's a global story right now yeah. for us as well in Montreal. Right. So I want to talk or focus uh, our discussion on your information design company. Um, I think there are there are several of these around, but uh, I think folks would be interested in hearing more about how you actually founded the company and how you manage it. I think there's a lot of freelancers, as we both know, doing terrific work. But when you're a freelancer, it's just you, as opposed to your company where you have staff and you have to manage the staff, you have to pay the staff, you have to do the HR part. So there's a lot to it. So um, maybe we can start by having you just talk about, you know, you started it, we met when you were working at the World Bank, which is thousands of employees, and then moved to Montreal and started this company. So maybe you could start by talking a little bit about that change from working from a huge company to, to starting your own. Yeah, well, I, I should start by saying that I always wanted to have a company, but mm. I didn't care to have one that I didn't know anything about, you know, selling nails and screws and these kind of things. I, I really needed like a, I'm not this much of an entrepreneur that I would do anything. I, yeah. I have a mentor here, a business mentor, and he was in online gaming, then in glasses and sunglasses, <laughs> and then in accounting. He doesn't care. He's an entrepreneur. Right. He loves to, that's not my profile at all. So I've, I, I was always curious to be an entrepreneur, but I needed to have my own idea, actually, to have something that I really believed in. So this was dormant for, for several years. And I really only discovered information design 
like in my late 20s, early 30s, actually, I think I was probably 30 years old when I discovered, uh, I, like many people, Edward Tufte and PowerPoint is evil and these kind of things that made me realize that this field actually exists. But I did not decide to start a business right there, actually. I continue, it, it was more like a hobby in my perception or, or like a skill maybe that I would have. And so soon after that, I got this job at the World Bank. I was not in this field at all. What I was doing is called donor relations. It's not very important, but I did this for six years. While developing my own like information design skills, I went to trainings, I was reading about this and, and I was developing this, but it was not really a skill that was in demand from my yeah. employer. You know, it was just like, well, your graph is nice, but you know, have you finished this report, please? You know, I'm, I'm waiting <laughs> or like organize this meeting or give me the minutes of the meeting or whatever yeah. I have to do for this. So, but then I really had this breakthrough moment where uh, after some sort of management meeting to which I attended, it was all PowerPoint slides. And you can imagine, you no, I don't think you can imagine how bad the graphs were. Like, seriously, <laughs> it was like, like now I cannot, like, I, you would have like a, a, a bar graph. One column is like this high, it says 28%. There's another column identical next to it. It says 0% in it. <laughs> Go figure that both the same heights, one is 28, the other one is zero. It looked like this, the whole the whole thing. And I was in the back just fuming and redesigning this thing. And, you know, on my own personal time, trying to think, how can we present that? And I had been trying to switch job internally for quite a while. And uh, one day I had, I was very lucky. I was with um, one of the higher ups in uh, Paris, actually, for like one of our uh, events there. And so, you know, you're in the smaller teams, you have more like personal mm -hmm. time with those people. And I told her like, I want to switch. I want to do something different. I've been in the same position for six years by now. Yeah. And uh, actually, I, in the course of that discussion, I said, well, I have something I can show you. You know, and and I pulled these graphs that I had started making and, you know, she like literally grabbed me by the ear and said, like, come over here. You know, like you, you I have <laughs> you're going to do this now full time. Now, I, yeah. I, I need this as a manager here. I need to see my data much better. And so this was my first like they, they created like a special position that's called a developmental assignment. It's it's for a determinate period of time. So for two years. I was in this position to redo management reports internally. Mm. And so this is how I like I became an information designer, you know, yeah. after so, some sort of personal training, doing it myself, and then finally getting noticed by someone that was uh, high enough uh, to actually create that position, to see the needs, to see the value, and to create the position. So I spent two years doing this, and then I was told, uh, great. Now go back to your former position. And I was, no, I have found <laughs> love now, <laughs> you know, when you know, you know. Yeah. So I just decided that this was the time, actually, my oldest daughter was about to enter school. Uh, we, I had been abroad for 10 years by then. I sort of wanted to like be closer to my family. I wanted to keep doing this. I wanted my kid to go to school in French. Mm -hmm. uh, what you hear is not a British accent. It's actually French. <laughs> <laughs> I, so we came back to Montreal to start this business, actually. So I left my job. And I, I know that for a lot of people, that's the hard part. Like, how do yeah. I let go of my stable? This was not a worry for me. I think I'm no. like overly confident when it comes to the job market. I'm just like, I cannot imagine ending under a bridge. Like, you know, yeah. like like yeah. you know, sleeping under a bridge, like I will figure it out for sure. Yeah. You know? So I left that job and came here. And But at the same time, and this is important to know for people who want to uh, become freelancers or start a business in this, I had sort of the connections at the World Bank to, to mm -hmm. do this, you know, and they, they sort of gave me my first contracts as well. As I was leaving, my department uh, gave me my first contracts and my connections then across the World Bank started to like see with me. So this is not something to be neglected in my story of grit and courage and hard work. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Was there a information design industry in Montreal at all? Was there anybody doing this when when you well, when you moved um, up there? At the time, it was function f function. Oh, f function, uh, right? But you may have heard of uh, of them. You know, the funny thing is, I first met them in New York at a conference. I, I forget now in 2014, and there were speakers, both of them, the founder Sebastien Audrey. 
And um, so I went and introduced myself, and it turns out that we worked in the same building. They were on the second oh, floor. Oh, wow. Sixth floor, <laughs> yes, in Montreal. <laughs> wow. So uh, I was a, a big admirer of their work as well. At the time, they were showing what they had done with HP and Conservation, Conservation International to show some pictures that were taken of, uh, mm -hmm. around the world, and so uh, pictures of wildlife. And I've always followed what, what they were doing. Like I, we founded Visualisation Montréal as well. So there's a meetup. We have 1,800 mm -hmm. members by now. So, uh, but it's like I came to Montreal and I was looking for this community. I was like, where's the meetup? There were no meetups. So yeah. I, I, I contacted a few of those people. In Montreal, we also have Plotly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, which is a tool, actually, you know, it's not like a design business like us. Uh, right. We are much more like function, except that function had a lot more uh, technical skills than we have. Like Sebastian, one of the co-founders was a programmer. Um, and I'm the opposite of a programmer. I have no skills in this. And, but they have, uh, I don't know if closed is the right way to put it or suspended, but uh, Sebastian has moved out of Canada and uh, Audrey has, has taken, out a, taken up a job in industry. Okay. Uh, and so now we also have uh, Chris Vio, who's uh, kind of well connected. He's at D3. Mm -hmm. uh, he has like a big Twitter account with over 10,000 followers and this. He works in the Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm going to forget a lot of people, but at Plutly, we have Nicola Krushten, uh, who's fairly uh, active on social media as well. Uh, and so, and, and a few individuals as well and courses and all, but it's, it's and, and some of the media are developing this increasingly, but we're not at the stage of the US media. But yes, there was right. a bit of a community and my goal is to put, like literally Montreal on the map. And when I say on the map, I'm trying to see something else than maps of Manhattan. Always when people are <laughs> testing data, it's always New York. It's yeah. always Manhattan. Yeah. yeah, I'm very keen on getting maps of Toronto and Montreal and Vancouver or whatever, if it's Paris or London. But uh, like literally like both bringing information design to Montreal, making people realize that this can be a job and making people talk about Montreal as like a source. I mean, it's funny because when I arrived, I knew that Montreal was a city of design according to UNESCO. I was mm -hmm. super enthusiastic about this. And then I read about it and it means that it has potential. <laughs> <laughs> it just needed you. They, that's all it needed, it needed you. I guess you were the uh, potential. Move on uh, to the next stage uh, yeah. the UNESCO of something. But yes, <laughs> this is the, the community that was here. So, um, okay, so this is around 2013 or so. Um, so you, you move back up to Montreal, you're building this community or, or finding, really finding the community and, and getting in place. So tell us a little bit about the early stages of the, of, of Voila, and then how has it evolved over the last, what, I guess, eight years or so? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember fondly the first year because I had much less work than I do today. And I had time to develop <laughs> material. I had time to set up my website. And I had right. my, sometimes now I'm like, okay, I need new material, but this client is expecting this and I'm meeting the team at that point. And when am I exactly going to do this? And the kids want me, et cetera. And so uh, the first year was much more calm. Uh, I had those first few appointments from uh, the, the World Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working by myself. And one thing that I should clarify is that I always wanted to build a team. Like I did not set out to be a freelancer forever. I mean, this is why it has a name on, of its own, you know, voila, it's not attached to me. I, I'm trying to build something bigger than me because I do not have a lot of technical skills. So mm -hmm. I, I want to be able to do more of what I envision, but cannot do myself. And I want to do it better than I can do it myself. So I always wanted to uh, to build this. And there's the entrepreneur as well. I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, and I'm talking more to the entrepreneurs here on the line, but building something that like a system, like a machine, like something that works, you know, and, and think of any business that you go through, they have processes, they have standards, they have like knowledge and all. And I'm, I'm super interested in that part of, mm -hmm. of building a business. Like we have a new project that comes in and we have a process. It's going to go through, you know, even if it's creative and it's, it's very hard, you know, to, to build 
a process around something so creative and so hard to anticipate even. So, right. but, you know, you look at the big four of the uh, consulting businesses and, and that's what they do. You know, they never know exactly which company is going to ask them for which business strategy or what. And if they can do it, we can do it. Uh, yeah. So, so when was the point where you said, I need now to start hiring people? Um, it was, honestly, it was after one year that I decided. So in 2014, I said, okay, I need to start associating and maybe not hiring, but, you know, at first, like collaborating with others, maybe yeah. working together. And then um, it was more like personal setbacks at the time, stuff more in my personal life that delayed this. And I had to put this more on hold and keep the freelancing business going. And it actually took me quite a few years to get back to it because it's only in 2019. So like five years later that really, I, I mean, I had associated with a few people to deliver some like specific stuff, but fairly rarely, honestly. Mm -hmm. And then in 2019, I realized that, I guess I realized I was getting old. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's, um, I was getting exhausted of clicking. That's how I call it. You know, doing yeah. a lot of the things that are mechanical to me, that are like, I know how to do them, I could delegate them. And yeah. I had this like long term vision of myself. I'm like, do I really want to be doing this in 10 years? Like, where yeah. do I want to be in 10 years? Do I see myself engaging the client alone, doing the negotiation, the invoicing, fixing the printer and you know, doing everything <laughs> yeah. and the conceptual and the, the clicking, as I call it. And I said, no, I'm I'm. I was afraid of being exhausted before the finish line. You know, I thought mm -hmm. like if I keep doing this, I'm going to snap at like 52 or something like this yeah. way too early for it. And so I said like I have now while I still have like the energy, the drive, I really have this interest to really like stop what I'm doing and assemble a team. Mm -hmm. And at that point, actually, I I did something that I, I never wanted to do before. I did not have the courage, I guess, <laughs> to do it. I, I said no to work so as to free up time because I wanted to start this business and assemble a team before, but I always thought I would do it in parallel, you know, like I accept the yeah. work and I do the work and then I do, but it requires so much mental energy to do this mm -hmm. that like, you know, doing it in the evenings, doing it in, on the weekends or like just with the parenting and, and yeah. even trying to rest, maybe, who knows. Right. Uh, I, I just couldn't do it. So I had to say no to contracts. I had to really take a hit in my uh, in my income mm -hmm. and just say now my project this week is finding myself an office because I was working from home at this time. And then my project is really to think of who do I want to hire and mm -hmm. what is the profile and how do I go about this? And my project is to redo completely the image of the, the, the company so that people get it that it's not like before and that they yeah. engage us as a business not just as me with a business name so i really had to put a, a lot of things on hold to be able to build this business apart i i had this image in my head what i was doing before that it was like i wanted to open a restaurant but every day i was going to sell hot dogs on the street you know yeah, right <laughs> and so right now i had to give up on this hot dog income and say, okay, I'm going to have to write a menu. I'm going to have to hire staff. I'm going to have to renovate the space. I'm going to like go without much of an income for quite a while. And then mm -hmm. we reopen and then it's a business. So, um, so that's what really was difficult for me. I would say that I had probably been trying to do that for a couple of years before I decided to suspend work. Suspend. And, and so for freelancers who are listening to this and who are maybe considering a similar path, Mm -hmm. In your experience, what should their expectations be? So if they're going to follow this path of, I, I need to stop work, I need to pause mm -hmm. on the work and just focus on the space and the hiring and the technology and the mm -hmm. HR. In your experience, like what does that time frame look like? And then how long does it take to sort of ramp the work back up? Um, that's a good question. I remember st really like starting to suspend work in March 2019. And uh, my first staff arrived in August 2019. I had an intern before that, which was very useful, especially as an experience for me. Some, mm -hmm. Someone was supposed to come for six weeks. 
and she was very good and very easy to manage, you know, like autonomous and these kind of things. So, yeah. so it did help me to like before making a commitment to someone to see how I was feeling with, with uh, someone. But she was really a, an intern in that she did not have a lot of information design expertise. I really had to uh, teach her stuff. And, but it was great for me to like get out. I, I had no choice but to rent an office for that person yeah. you know, so that we would work somewhere together. The first staff really arrived in August. And then in October, we had a party to mm -hmm. sort of uh, really highlight that, okay, now we're a business. I want to introduce you to my staff and, and our projects and our products. And we had like printed stuff on the walls. And I had like half were clients or collaborators. The other half were just family filling up the room. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it's, like, it's just embarrassing. Uh, but I, I always felt that this, this party actually for me was like a milestone. I needed some things to be done to have a party. And so yeah. it forced me to actually think through a lot of things. I didn't need the party itself and there yeah, were not a lot right. of clients, but it was a motivator. It was a milestone for me. So now we're in, in October. And if you ask about ramping up, really, I would say like within a year, it was probably back yeah, maybe even less than a year. I, honestly, I've mm -hmm. always been very lucky with work in that yeah. it just, you know, I built it and they came. The related question, when you decided to say no to work and to focus on building the, the initial staffing in the office mm -hmm. and all that, did you tell your clients, I assume a lot of these were clients that you've been working with for, for mm -hmm. several years, did you tell them, I'm pausing on new work for this particular reason, but in... X number of months, let's let's reconnect. So again, for those freelancers yeah. who are listening, is that that sort of strategy of like, hey, I'm not shutting everything down. I'm just kind of retooling and, and let's talk in five months or something. Well, it was, it was both uh, better and worse than this, <laughs> better because I did not shut down everything. Mm -hmm. I, I was still doing some work during right. that, but I was much more selective about it. And worse because I was a consultant at the World Bank. That's how I was getting business from them. And I needed to uh, become a business to them, not an individual. Mm. And so a right. lot of places, you know, they differentiate between the two and it's very different. And to go from one to the other, I had to do no work whatsoever for them for one year at least. Mm. So I literally had to tell all of them, I am not doing anything for one year and hope that they're going to be there a year yeah. later. And right. even to become a business, it's fairly complicated. They need to invite you. They need to fill a lot of paperwork. They don't like doing this. So you need to find someone who's motivated <laughs> to actually do this for you. So it was like a big risk. And I remember people around me being like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, can't you like find another way of like keeping this relationship, but delegating the work? And this would have been like, like skirting the rules. And I, this is not my, <laughs> really my, my profile. Right. I wanted things to be really clean. And I wanted also to develop more outside of the World Bank. I mean, it, it already mm -hmm. had a business outside of it, but I did not want to be dependent on, on a client like this. And so I, I used that year really. It's like, I think in, in March, I made my decision. In April, I started telling my clients that out of, as of July 1st, I was not uh, doing any more work for them. Basically, I had to. I, I came back after a year, and already before the year was was over, I had former clients coming back saying, "Like, are you ready now? Are you ready?" Yeah. And I said yes, and so it started again. And what's great is that, as a business, we do more ambitious work because there's more of us, and and right. so we get even more visibility, we get more capacity, and also it was totally worth it to take those chances. But as I said in the beginning about leaving my job, those are like. I think I'm fairly risk prone compared to some people, you know, it's hard to yeah. say no to work, but at the same time, I find that it's been some of my best decisions to say no sometimes. And, right. and so uh, to, to really focus on what we're good at. And in this case, saying no to clients for a year was really like, it, it was a bit like, you know, when you go to school, like, yes, you delay when you're going to make money, but you know, right. it's really going to make a huge difference. Right. It pays off the end. Yeah. So, okay, so now you are hiring people, you have an office space, you've ramped back up. What does that mean for you now as not being the principal designer doing the work, but you're doing, I mean, well, first off, I guess, what is the share now between your management responsibilities and your actually creation responsibilities? And then I think the more important question probably for most listeners is what is your day-to-day -day like now as the, as the you know, 
principle of, of the company. Yeah, I think I, I'm going to give you the easy answer, which is 50-50. And that's right. when, when you don't know what to say, you always say 50 <laughs> So, uh, or both. <laughs> or both. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in this case, like, really, I have much more management responsibilities, of course. And I mean... At the same time, some of it is no longer on me because I have a project manager, so she takes care of invoicing and you know proposals for clients and all, and she does like ninety percent of the work. I come back, I come at the end to like approve, polish, uh, comment on, on it, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then the other fifty is still in production. It allows me to be really at my point of highest value added, mm -hmm. uh, which is, in my opinion, at the very conceptual stage, like really cracking that thing, like what is the visual going to look like and, right. and what is the data? And, and, and so really, and I'm the only one at the moment. Well, no, we just hired someone who has a sociology degree, but until recently, I was really the only one with like this substantial studies. I, I studied international development, economics, and, and environment. So I had to embrace the work and, and to do the analysis for, for the team. And I still do. And it's a part of my work that is extremely challenging mm -hmm. because, you know, it's this creativity part and you have no idea if you're going to crack it in five minutes or in five days, you know, right. <laughs> it's, it's right. not clear. And, but I love it because it's so satisfying when you do. <laughs> There's a moment yeah. like, yeah, I got it. And the client right. is like, wow. I'm like, yes, this is why <laughs> I do this job. Right. And the other part of managing the, the company and the team is like surprisingly pleasant to me. Mm -hmm. uh, first, you know, we have an A team, really. It's like uh, recruiting is very difficult. But if you have like great people, it's such a pleasure to uh, to work with them and to just delegate and trust. And, and so this part is pleasant. But to go back to what I was saying earlier, I love to build a system, a machine, a process. I love that part. And then seeing it activate, you know, when something mm -hmm. comes in and just like, oh, my God, this is going to work. You know, we're going to end up, it's not a good example, but we're going to end up with a Big Mac. Like, you know, there's like all yeah. those suppliers and there's this process. And then at the end, oh, my God, I can repeat that thing, you know. And yeah, it's, yeah. It's almost like the cartoon uh the, the cartoon machine that goes <laughs> and at the end, it comes yeah. out of two or whatever. Yeah, I love building that 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 thing, and and I love that the whole team is very uh, involved in this. And what can we do differently? What should be our process? Who should do it first? And how, mm. how do we decide that? Or, or how do we create? How do we manage? How do we propose? Everyone is very much into this, like I am, and I I really like this aspect. And because I was so keen and eager for a long time to start a business, even the very boring admin stuff of like government permits and whatnot are rewarding. I don't want to say pleasant, but right, right. I, yes, you know, I get <laughs> this form filled, you know, and this is yeah. a form for businesses and entrepreneurs. And yeah. you know, I am one now. And, right. and <laughs> it, You're part it, of the club, it, right. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of the the very first time I identified myself as an information designer was like just as I started business, I went back to Washington to talk to the to the the World Bank, and I met this custom officer, and he asked me, "What do you do for a living?" Said, yeah, oh, sir, thanks for asking. <laughs> I'm an information designer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow your mind right now. <laughs> yes, this is my sir. actual passport. This is how I would redesign it. So just so you can see. <laughs> oh my God. Don't, 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 don't tempt me. But, and, and now I feel the same rush about like being, oh, I'm an entrepreneur now, you know, yeah. I feel boring forms. It's great. You know? Right. <laughs> right. Cool things. So I, I think this is what I was saying that I had reached that point where my motivation for doing everything, which had been there in the beginning, I was like, oh, I can't believe they asked me to do their report. Like I get to do this design, I get to yeah. do the graphs and I was super motivated. But after like five, six years of doing this, I was like, it was repetitive. I had done this before. And now why is InDesign not managing the footnotes properly? And <laughs> yeah, right. I was like, is this really a good use of my time to fix the footnotes here? Yeah. And couldn't I like ask someone to do this? And actually, that's one of the reasons why the first person I hired was a graphic designer. Mm. I felt that this was the thing that was easiest for me to delegate as a bunch, you know, as a, a yeah. developer ball and say, okay, this is like a lot of work. Like you can like set up this, this report entirely uh, for us. And I was so lucky. We had such a good match 
Uh, my graphic designer is also a scientific illustrator. Mm. So it's someone who is used to get into the substance and understanding something that is complex, which is not always easy to find, and an illustrator on top of it. So, you know, can, right. can do the graphic design. Can can do it. So I'm, I'm going back to this, but the HR and like the recruitment, uh, building a good team is really, it's what yeah. it is. You know, we sell time and expertise. We don't, right. uh, there's nothing physical for sale. So how many, um, how many employees are you at now? Oh, I'm glad you asked, Mr. Schwabisch. <laughs> <laughs> I have four employees. That's me. That means five of us in yeah. less than two years. I'm very, yeah. very pleased. That's amazing. With, yeah, it's actually the fifth one. Uh, and I, I count myself now in, in those five, but the fifth one is coming on Monday as well. And so it's great. Also, I think I wanted to have a business because I wanted friends at work, you know, colleagues, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, just yeah. to work alone with my clients whom I met. But and, and it's just like, I, I often have this moment where when we go on a video conference for our meeting, we, of course, everyone's working from home now. And I see those faces. I'm like, yeah. this is the business, you know, this yeah. is our team. And right, it's your team. and you brought it together, which is yeah. like, that must be a source of pride, right? That, you know, it's not just a meeting on Zoom with random people. It's yeah. it's the team that you brought together exactly. and took for a and, common purpose. Yeah. And sometimes it's the details of like uh, someone's gonna say, uh, "Yeah, I bought a bicycle." I'm like, "Yes, I'm glad you're earning a living here." And you know, right. like we can you can buy a bicycle with this, right. or you went to do the groceries. Just this proud pride of. I mean, I I do not like an over uh, an overdeveloped sense of like. Uh, how how do you call it in in the U.S. like the job creators or whatever you know that, that yeah. thing? It, there is something to me about creating this business out of thin air, mm -hmm. like out of and even in a field that is not very well known at the moment too, and and just having it like suddenly like voila couldn't survive without me at the moment and I say that without any pride actually it's the opposite I wish that I could build something that could survive yeah. without me but. Very soon. And I see, by the way, I see the difference between my old and my new clients. The old ones, they write to Francis. The new ones, they write to Voila. You know, right. they're really, they're, there's Chloe, our project coordinator who, and client coordinator, who's like, the, the and, and it just feels like, okay, for them, this is a business. One of the person that I hired was a replacement for someone who left. And, you know, it's just smooth, you know, there's someone like the client is just, that's fine. As long as you deliver, you no, know, it's, it's fine with us. This is what I like about it to, to, to yeah. create something that has an identity in itself apart from me, because I, I won't be able to do this all the time. And I want to be able to, to move around the business as well. Mm -hmm. My vision is that of a, I, I have no idea how it works, but of an architecture firm. Uh, I have this vision that the head architect has a vision, is involved in every project to a certain extent you know of where this is yeah. going but not necessarily in drawing every staircase and these kind yeah, of yeah 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 so this is where i would like the voila to be but i want to give like a lot of room to people and and the expertise that's why they write on the blog and these kind of things yeah that's great that is terrific um congrats on all of that um i mean that's amazing five people in the lat and what not even not even two years yeah, I mean, not even yeah, well. Yeah. Four, five, if you uh, if you count. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But really, once you decided to really, you know, do it, really less than two years. It's it's fantastic. Um, congratulations. Um, I'll put links to uh, to Voila and, and and your other um, social media places and the blog on the show notes, so folks can take a look and visit uh, the website to see uh, the work and to check out the team. Uh, Francis, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure chatting. With you. Thank you, John. Talk to you soon then. Okay. <laughs> Bye. And thanks to everyone for tuning in to this week's episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned a lot. I'm sure if you're interested in learning more about how to start up your own data visualization or information design company, Francis would be happy to chat with you. And you can reach out to him on any of the different links that I've included in the episode notes. So until next time, this has been the Policy of His Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. A number of people help bring you the Policy Viz podcast. Music is provided by the NRIs. Audio editing is provided by Ken Skaggs. And each episode is transcribed by Jenny Transcription Services. If you would like to help support the podcast, please share it and review it on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The Policy Viz podcast is ad-free and supported by listeners. If you'd like to help support the show financially, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash policyviz.